Hey guys, I have a Polk Audio Model PSW505 subwoofer. Belongs to a friend of mine, complaining of it popping and cracking, power indicator coming on and off, and just generally acting crazy. I checked online first and found that there are quite a few people out there having a similar situation. So, we're going to tear into this and hopefully there will be some solutions here that will help you guys out. With the power disconnected, I removed the 10 screws around the perimeter of the amp board and the board comes right out. Let's see if we can duplicate the problem. distortion coming out. There's nothing connected to it right now. Volume is irrelevant. So that's what it sounds like. If we turn the amp board around, it's divided into three sections. The top board being the input and the volume control. This is mainly a preamp. The middle board is the audio amplifier itself connected to the speaker and the bottom is a large power supply that supplies the main power minus and plus 57 volts to the amplifier. There's also a smaller 15 positive and 15 negative volts coming out of this supply to do the preamp and the smaller components of the main amp. Since this problem seems to be independent of input uh, signal, we're going to take a look at the power supplies first to make sure that they're clean and not causing the distortion problem. I can tell you that we got 110 volts coming in here. It's being switched through the supply. This is high voltage. This is dangerous. You can get killed if you don't know what you're doing. These capacitors can act like shotgun shells if something goes wrong. So you don't want these facing you while you're doing this troubleshooting. To help with that, I have soldered on some clip leads wires to the main supply, the minus and plus 57 volts. We're going to spin this around away from us so it's not pointed at us while we have this lit up. Should there be a problem, the problem's going to go back in the cabinet and not in your face. The plus and minus 57 volt supplies are now here with these three clip leads. I got ground, plus and minus 57 volts. I can connect a voltmeter or a scope to here, be able to see what's coming out of that supply and still be in a safe place. We'll get started measuring the supplies by measuring the DC voltage. Flip it on. We'll check the uh, supply here. We have 57.2 DC. Come over here, we'll check the other one. Minus 57. So we have the right voltages. That's good. Let's take a look at them with a scope and make sure that it's a clean DC. There's no AC ripple in it. My scope over to the other side of the power supply. Back on. Oh boy, look at all that. Still in 0.2 volts per division, AC mode. Got a lot of nasty there on that power supply. It's possible that's coming back from the amp, but I really, really doubt it. We're going to troubleshoot the power supply a little deeper. So to disconnect this amp panel so we can better troubleshoot the power supply, turn it around here, and this is where these the subwoofer is connected. We just need to pull up on these two connectors. You might have to squeeze that bottom with a needle nose because it may have a key to lock it in. So just take these two off and then we can get to the power supply down here. Okay, we have the amp panel on the bench. To disconnect the power supply, there is a connector up here, another one here, and then the main leads coming in at the bottom. The, these two connectors are keyed, so there's really only one way you can put them in. These are not. Pay attention to the way this is done so you can put it back together the way you took it apart. The black is the line 
the white is neutral. So you, there's an L and an N, but anyway, make sure you get this back the way it came out. To uh, get the amp board out, there are a half a dozen or so Phillips screws around the perimeter. Uh, we'll take those off and we'll get this board on the bench. We have the power supply on the bench. The least likely components to cause the problem that we heard would be the coils or the transformers. The ICs and regulators would be suspect, but the most likely cause of what we heard will be these electrolytic capacitors. So we're going to check the electrolytics first. Closer at the board, <clears throat> many of these components are covered with the silicone. I notice a bit of what looked like smoke coming from this side. I peeled back the silicone and found a Zener diode underneath that's cracked. Luckily this supply is set up in a mirrored situation from the positive and negative side. So the similar Zener is underneath this silicone, which I'll be able to pull that back, get the numbers off the Zener, and be able to replace this one. In addition to checking the caps around the Zener that blew, we also want to take a good look at all the solder joints on this board, since there's a lot of components here that generate a lot of heat. Going to set the power supply underneath the stereoscope, be able to take a good look at the joints. Not surprisingly, I found a bad joint on the large power resistor next to the Zener that popped. Let's see if I can show it to you. There it is. See, the, see it move? It's a bad solder joint all the way back from the factory days. I'm going to go ahead and clean this up and solder it properly. Since we're going to be testing capacitors for this project, let's talk a little bit about the ways to do that. The most common way for many years has just been to use a multimeter, putting the leads on the cap itself. You'll see it charge up through the display and then eventually make it back to infinity. Switch the leads on the cap, do the same thing. It goes up to the ranges, back to infinity. That's a good cap. There's a little bit of electricity in the ohms mode that goes into the cap and we're discharging it and letting it discharge. That's a good cap by that test. The next way to do it and more accurately is to use a capacitance meter. This is a 680 microfarad capacitor and we get an instant reading of 618 microfarad which plus or minus um, 10%, you're talking 68 microfarad within range. So uh, that's clearly good enough for this test and a good cap. Unfortunately, the multimeter and the capacitance meter will not give you the same accurate reading when trying to measure that cap in circuit. The best way to check a cap is to use an ESR meter that we have over here. So an ESR meter or equivalent series resistance meter measures just that, the resistance of a cap at a certain frequency. I'll bring us up closer and you can see this cap says it's good with low ESR keep losing our focus here sorry by comparison I have a cap I pulled earlier from a circuit it didn't measure so well that's showing 9.77 ohms and it says this would be okay if the capacitance was less than 10 microfarad turns out this is a 22 microfarad capacitor so it did not pass the ESR test. Like I said, the best thing about an ESR meter is that you can do the same test with the caps in circuit, which saves a ton of time. So to do that, I've inserted a couple of finish nails into the alligator clips. You have to be careful not to use too long of a lead with an ESR meter because that will change things. So use the shorter leads to come with it. Do the little trick with the uh, finished nails and you can go straight to the circuit board. 
One more reminder about using the ESR meter is that each electrolytic cap has a polarity. There is a positive and negative marking on each cap. So pay attention to the markings. We're going to connect the negative to the black lead and the positive to the red lead on the ESR meter. One more note before measuring is to make sure all the electrolytics are discharged. Uh, you can do that with a uh, clip lead, screwdriver, whatever you have. Uh, there was never any major voltage in these to start with, but just make sure there's nothing in there so you don't shock your meter. So we'll try a couple. Zero point zero one eight, very low. Good cap with low ESR. Try the one next to it, get the polarity right. Zero point zero five two, again a very good cap. Quickly checked in circuit. So far we've checked all the caps around the edges on both sides. Everyone's okay so far. Now we'll try these smaller ones on the inside of the amp. So on that cap we're getting a reading of 2.82 ohms. Which is okay for a 22 microfarad if it's tw a 25 volt cap. Well down here there's a chart. If you can see the second line for 22 microfarad. Once we get up towards 50 volts, which is what this cap is, 1.5 is as high as you want to go. So getting 2.82 when we should have 1.5, uh, this cap is going to have some problems, so we'll get rid of it. Measuring another 22 mic nearby, we're getting 9.51 ohms. Says it's okay if it's less than 10, but it's a 22 microfarad cap, so we have another one here we need to replace. So on the main power supply, we didn't do too badly. Two caps to replace here, C306 and C114. Back to the main panel here, we're going to pull the amplifier board so we can get to the components better on it. Just need to disconnect this ribbon cable and there's three screws on the other side. Yeah, these three. That will uh, drop the amp board out. So here's the amplifier board, and we're going to do the same thing, checking the caps, identifying where they are located on the back side of the board, and then putting the ESR meter with a proper polarity on those pads. Well, right off the bat, I'm getting really no reading off the first cap I'm testing. Uh, says overflow, so I'm going to go ahead and pull it out. I'm curious what it will look like on the other meters. Here's the cap on the ESR meter out of circuit. Same reading, or no reading. It's meter. Should be a 10 microfarad reading. I'm in the 100 mic scale. Zero. Connect it to an ohm meter. I think we're hanging around 14 megs. So, not a good cap. There's enough room around some of these caps. We can go ahead and test them from the top side. Another cap that reads a little bit high. It's 22 microfarad, but at 50 volt rating, it should be reading around 1.5 ohms. So, about twice what it ought to be. We'll replace this one, too. Pushing forward here, I uh, found the larger... Electrolytics are fine, but on the smaller size electrolytics, six out of eight are either marginal or totally shot. So uh, for the cost of the caps, it's about 30 cents each. Time is everything. Let's just shotgun all eight of the smaller electrolytics and, and get on with it. Moving on to the input board. Everything is pretty much out in the wide open here, so... We'll leave that board where it is and just troubleshoot the caps where they sit. There is a good one. That one's okay. Again, pushing forward here, there are eight electrolytic caps on the input board and all of them test fine. 
Here's a summary list of what I found bad. Looks like 10 caps and one TVS slash Zener diode. So I ordered the parts and put them in and let's hook this up and see what happens. So everything is wired back together. I did want to mention that replacing some of these caps was a bit of a trick because the holes are plated through. Getting the solder to flow out easily is kind of hard sometimes. So if you're having difficulty removing the old solder, try adding some new solder to the joint first. So we have an audio source connected. Power is ready to go. Let's see what happens. Turn it up. There we go. Let's go ahead and put this back together. Well, Full disclosure here, the amp would play fine for about 30 seconds, no noise, so the capacitors did their job, but it's shutting down after about 30 seconds. I've checked the power supplies once again. They're all measuring what they, they used to. They're okay. But I'm curious about the amplifier itself maybe causing a problem. And usually when something overheats, you can reverse the problem with free spray. So I have a can of refrigerant here. I'm going to try it on the amplifier and see if that makes a difference. There. Okay, let's narrow that down. Since we'll be troubleshooting some live electronics here, it's a good time to put on the safety glasses. Going back further in the circuit, I found one area that's extremely sensitive to the free spray. See if I can get out of your way here. Just a little bit in that area. Looks like a uh, ceramic or a mylar cap or perhaps a diode next to it. After moving the wiring harness over, it's a little transistor here. Q1 takes just a drop of free spray to kick it back on. I'm going to replace Q1, so I'm going to go ahead and add it to the bottom of the parts list here. It's an MMBT5551. It's a very small transistor, so it's impossible to print such a large part number on it. To do that, it's marked with G1. To figure out what that means, I've added another link to a website here where you can go and see the decode on how to change from the two-letter designation to the actual part number of the part. So, subwoofer is back together. Been playing for about three hours now, so we'll call this one fixed. Thanks for watching.